China, all these parts of it, is the oldest settled culture on Earth. It's at least 3,000, probably more like 3,500 years old. And that, that means the language is rooted in a 3,500-year-old language. The writing system is rooted in a 3,500-year-old writing system. There has been a continuous culture. There have been times that the uh, government of China has split up into different factions and then came back together. But the Chinese culture is the oldest settled culture in the world. And we need to remember this. This is a giant that has been around forever. And it, for most of its existence, has been the superpower of East Asia. Significant parts of Korean, Japanese, and even Vietnamese down in Southeast Asia, significant parts of those three cultures are rooted in Chinese culture. Their writing systems, their legal systems, their philosophical systems, some of their religions come from China. And while China has been incredibly powerful for most of its existence, it has, over the last 40 years, actually been coming out of a century-long period where China had been hobbled. And so we need to understand that process if we're going to understand where China is today. 500 years ago, China really started turning inward. It really started limiting its contact with the outside world. You've probably heard of the Great Wall of China. The version we know of today was built 500 years ago in order to keep people out. Though the Chinese government was also very big about keeping Chinese in. They didn't want to have outside ideas coming into their culture. The whole idea was to turn China into an island that would not be conquered or polluted by outside cultures. But this led to a real issue. By the time we get to the 1800s, by the time we get to a couple hundred years ago, China had significantly fallen behind other countries, particularly European countries. Its government was outdated, its technology and its economy had not evolved very much since it had turned inwards. And meanwhile, Europe had for several centuries been on this constant state of expansion and experimentation. And so in 1839, Europe began a series of wars with China that just kind of whittled away China's sovereignty or China's ability to control itself. These wars were called the Opium Wars because the Europeans wanted to be able to sell opium to China. China said, yeah, we're cool on that. We don't need a bunch of people in our country that are hooked on this really powerful drug. And so Europe and the United States even went to war in order to force China to just say yes to drugs. And by the time we get to the year 1900, European countries had really just turned the Chinese government into a bunch of European puppets. And on this map, what you can see is how they kind of carved up everything for themselves. The British had taken over this whole chunk of what we call the Yangtze River. Also, this area down here in the southeast, which included places like Hong Kong. Germany had taken over a chunk in the north. The Japanese, who, as we'll see later on, had been becoming more westernized, had taken Korea away from China and had also taken away Taiwan, even controlling part of... China's southeast coast. The French essentially ran most of the south. And what this ultimately meant was that European countries and Japan and the United States extracted tons of wealth from China. Opium addiction became rather widespread amongst the Chinese population. And the massive amount of resources that China had beforehand that had allowed it to stay inward looking were essentially being robbed by outside countries who were really pulling all the governmental and economic strings. And finally, by the time we get to the early 1900s, there was a movement in China to try to reinvigorate the nation, to catch up to the rest of the world and take control of their affairs. But there were different perspectives on how this should be done. Some believed in nationalism, that they really should create a strong central government with a strong military and a strong sense of Chinese identity to throw out all the foreigners. Some believed in communism. And between the 1920s and 1940s, China went through a civil war as well as a major invasion by Japan during World War II. And I'm not super concerned that you know this timeline inside and out. I just want you to know that really starting in the mid-1800s, China was taken over by Europe, and then Japan invaded in the early 1900s, and then they had a civil war, 
things were rough. It really was just becoming chaotic throughout the country. But finally, in 1945, at the end of World War II, Japan was pushed out of China, and in 1949, the Communist Party won the Civil War. When this happened, the leader of the Communist Party of China, a man named Mao Zedong, and you do need to know that name, Mao Zedong, proclaimed the People's Republic of China. Now, that other nationalistic group, they ran away to a place called Taiwan. Again, we'll be talking about Taiwan later on, but this is how Taiwan becomes separated from China. This also, by the way, 1949, is the birth of Communist China. Now, before we talk about Communist China, I do want to make sure we understand who this guy Mao Zedong was. You could kind of call him the George Washington of China. He founds the modern Chinese state. But as we're going to see here in a second, he was not really fit to govern a country, and he was not as interested in a democratic communist state as he had proclaimed to be early on. He wanted to be the dictator. And his name, Mao Zedong, this is something that you absolutely not, must know about China. The family name in China comes first. So he came from the Mao family. Zedong was his personal name. And so when we talk about Chinese leaders, just how we normally talk about leaders by their last name, President Obama, President Trump, in China, the family name comes first. So we talk about people like Chairman Mao, not Chairman Zedong. Just remember that. Family name in China comes first. China has 22 provinces. That's all the yellow ones on here. And a province is kind of like a state here in the United States. It runs its own business. It's subject to the central government, but it also oversees its own counties and cities. Five autonomous regions, and we'll be talking about those more later on, but autonomous regions are places that have heavy minority populations, that most of the population is not the main ethnicity of China, the Han Chinese, more on them in a little bit. But these autonomous regions are supposed to be able to maintain their own culture, maintain their own lifestyle, though they do have Chinese governors that oversee them and quite often don't respect the culture of the people who live there. There are four municipalities, and municipalities are essentially just big cities that aren't responsible to any province. They, they are directly underneath the central government. And two special administrative regions down here on the southeast coast of the PRC, of the People's Republic of China, Hong Kong and Macau. These are two areas that used to be European colonies that have a history of democracy and capitalism. And when Britain gave Hong Kong back to China and Portugal gave Macau back to China, they had guaranteed that the citizens that lived there would be able to keep their democracy and their capitalism at least for a good chunk of time. We're going to be looking at one of those in some detail later on. We'll be looking at Hong Kong in later lectures and videos. Now, like I said, Communist China underneath Mao Zedong, he wasn't the best leader, and it didn't get off to the best start. Mao Zedong so mismanaged the country that tens of millions of people starved in China when he was in charge. He also really had a beef with anybody that he saw as an elitist or a part of the elite. So scientists, doctors, lawyers, teachers... He very often had them removed from their jobs and sent out to work as peasants in the countryside, or he just had them killed. And you can imagine what this does to a country's ability to teach new people, to keep the country healthy, to research new ideas. You don't want to kill or just send off all of your best educated folks if you want to have a strong and successful country. And so by the time Mao died in 1976, the country was in a pretty bad place. But the next leader to come in, a man named Deng Xiaoping, Deng really started changing the game. He began investing heavily in education, particularly in science and engineering. He also made some pretty significant changes to the economy. Underneath Mao Zedong, the, the economy had been totally centralized. Companies were created by the government and staffed with government officials, and each one had to meet quotas and sell at state-mandated prices. But in the 1980s, Deng Xiaoping started allowing companies to sell whatever they made past their quota at whatever price they wanted. In other words, 
if your company was really doing a good job, it filled the quota that the government required and it sold those at the price the government required, but then it can make extra stuff and try to actually make a profit. People were allowed to open up privately owned small shops. And beyond, the, and beyond these broad reforms to the whole country, probably the most important thing he did is he created something called special economic zones. These special economic zones, or SEZs, were areas with much less state control. The idea was that people could start companies with their own money, make what they want, and try to sell it on a relatively free market. Part of the goal of this, when he created the first four SEZs, or special economic zones, along the southeast coast of China, was that he wanted foreigners, he wanted people from outside the country, to start investing in China. And you can imagine, before this, I mean, who's going to ever invest anything in China? Everything belongs to the government. You're essentially just giving money to the Chinese government. But if a private company can actually exist, and they could go scout folks to find the best of, or the people most willing to work the hardest in order to get a little bit higher pay, but that pay is still pretty low compared to many other countries like the United States, well, that all of a sudden becomes a place that a lot of foreign business folk want to invest in. Because if you can make a television in the United States, but you have to pay your workers a minimum wage, or you have to pay them a living wage, you have to pay them 15 or $20 an hour, but you can instead build a factory in China in one of these special economic zones and pay workers a dollar an hour, and it's still twice as much as they're getting from the Chinese government if they work for a Chinese company, well, now you can actually make a significant profit even though you have to pay shipping costs, even though you still have to pay tariffs when things come over the border. It becomes so cheap to make things there, it becomes a good investment for foreign investors. And this is a term that you need to be aware of that we didn't talk about in the first unit called foreign direct investment, FDI. FDI is how much money people from outside the country invest into businesses within your country. Now, for just about the entire 20th century, the United States was the number one recipient of FDI, of foreign direct investment, where people from other countries wanted to invest in the U.S. stock market, invest in U.S. businesses. Well, about 10 years ago, China passed us up. We're now number two. So like I said, Deng Xiaoping creates these special economic zones in 1980, and then over the course of the 1980s, he kept adding more areas, 14 more cities in 1984, three deltas, three ends of rivers in 1985. In 1988, Hainan province, or the big island in the southern portion of China, was added in, and then in 1992, six ports along the major Yangtze River, you can think of it kind of like China's Mississippi River, were opened up to semi-free markets. I don't want to overplay this. In most of these special economic zones, the Chinese government still requires that they get to own a portion of the business. And this is part of how things have become kind of dicey for U.S. investors. So you might be familiar with like places like Apple builds a lot of their hardware over in China. Well, if the Chinese government owns a little bit of the factory that Apple's building things in, the Chinese government might be able to go ahead and just take some of that technology that Apple is putting into their phones over there. This change to their economy really got things working. By the time we get to the 1990s, China was clearly an up-and-comer. It was receiving more and more FDI. It was producing more every year. And it was starting to lobby to join the WTO. Of course, once you get into the World Trade Organization, tariffs dropped quite dramatically. And in 2001, China was admitted to the WTO. The hope of many people at the time was that integrating China into the world economy would introduce the Chinese population to more democracy, to more culture outside of China, and that eventually China would itself become a democracy and a fully capitalist country. It doesn't look right now like China is going that direction, but it's still early in the experiment, you know, if we're thinking on a centuries-long scale. In 2008, China became the second largest economy in the world, passing up Japan. 
And in that same year, in 2008, they became the largest recipient of FDI, of foreign direct investment, passing us up. Now, some of this already makes sense because China is a big country. If China had a fully developed economy, we would totally expect it to have one of, if not the largest economy in the world. In terms of land mass, China is the fourth largest country in the world behind Russia, Canada, and the United States. But if we think just about the continental United States, if we just think about the lower 48, the U.S. and China are pretty similar in size to each other. However, China has four times the population that the United States has. They have about 1.4 billion people. That makes them the largest country in the world by population. The United States is number three, with about 330 million people. And it's worth noting that our 330 million are pretty spread out. We have population centers like New York and L.A. and the Bay Area and Chicago. But most of China's population is over here in the east. So most of China's population lives in much more dense circumstances than we do here in the United States. Like I said, the modern Chinese state really has only been around now for about 70 years. It's been around since 1949, but the Chinese identity and writing and culture go back at least 3,500 years. The people of that culture are called the Han. When you hear the word Han, you really should be thinking the ethnically Chinese folk. Everybody who lives in China is, by their nationality, Chinese. That's what it says. That they have Chinese passports. And they pay Chinese taxes and live under Chinese law. But normally when we think of Chinese people, we're thinking of the ethnic group of people that are Chinese, we are thinking of the Han. These are the folk who practice Han culture. They're speakers of various Han languages or Chinese languages, sometimes also called Sinitic languages. This is a term that you need to know, Sinitic. It comes from the Latin for China. The, the uh, Romans called China Sina. And so the prefix, anytime you see the prefix Sino, S-I-N-O, or an adjective like Sinitic, you know that you're talking about something related to China. So if we're talking about like Sino-Russian relations, we're talking about Chinese-Russian relations. Now, there are really about seven Sinitic languages, depending on how you count them. And the big variety of them are down here in the southeast. But the majority of Han folks speak the Sinitic language that we call Mandarin. So if you ever hear that term Mandarin Chinese, we're talking about a specific Chinese language, sometimes called a Chinese dialect, different from, say, Hakka or Cantonese down here, you Mandarin is essentially the standard Chinese. Chinese, all the Sinaitic languages, are what we call tonal languages. We're somewhat familiar with tone in language. If I were to say something like, I'm going to the store, you know that I'm making a statement. But if I change the tone of that, if I go, I'm going to the store, you know that I'm asking a question. So we're a little familiar with tones in our language, but where tones can affect our sentence structure and give it different meaning, the tone of the word itself radically changes the meaning of words in the Chinese languages, in the Sinitic languages. There are four tones, one which just stays high and flat. So if we were talking about like the uh, word ma, ma, all flat. One that rises in tone, ma, one which radically drops in tone, ma, and one which goes down then bends up. Ma. Now, I am not a Chinese speaker, so that's not exactly right, but you get the feel for it. You have these four different tones, and there's these great jokes about Westerners using this or trying to learn how to uh, uh, speak Chinese. You know, maybe they go home and they meet their mother-in-law for the first time if they had married a Chinese woman, and they say something like, I'm so pleased to meet you, mother. But they, instead of saying ma, when they say mother, they say ma, which of course means I'm pleased to meet you, horse. Each one of these tones makes any combination of letters mean radically different things. So you need to know that the Chinese languages are tonal, and you need to know there are four different tones. The basic tones, you need to understand that flat, 
rising up, rising radically down, and the bend downwards then up. These Chinese characters are the Chinese writing system. Um, in Chinese script, they do not have letters. They are not like in uh, English or in many European languages where you can just sound things out letter by letter. They have symbols that stand for entire words. So we had seen earlier the Confucian symbol that means water. This one over here means man. And characters can be combined in various ways to create new words. You can see over here how the symbol for tree can be multiplied to become the symbol for forest. And it says here man, that may be better translated as person, but person in a box is a prisoner. And so you can imagine learning how to read Chinese. It's not just learning 26 letters that you memorize and then you figure everything out from there. You have to memorize hundreds if not thousands of different characters in order to be able to understand any written portion of it. Though Chinese writing is extraordinarily interesting, about 2200 years ago, the first emperor of China decided, now these people that speak all these different languages, because each dialect of Chinese, each one of those uh, uh, Sinitic languages, they're not mutually intelligible. If somebody from Canton is talking to somebody that's speaking Mandarin, they're not going to understand each other. But Chinese characters, they all mean the same word no matter how you say it. So the symbol for man is the same in Mandarin and in Cantonese, even though they actually speak totally different words. One of the things you're going to be expected to know how to do in this course is recognize different world leaders. So you have to be able to recognize the current president of China, Xi Jinping. I'll say that again because I'm going to expect you to be able to spell out how you would sound it out. President Xi Jinping. So remember, family name comes first. We would just call him President Xi. Make sure you know that face. So in the modern day, the Han people make up over 90% of the entire population of China. They really are the majority ethnic group, but there are many other small minority groups, the Hui, the Manchus, the Uyghurs, the Tibetans, and we are going to be talking about a few of them. The majority of the Han live in what we call China proper, or Inner China. If you remember that population map just a little while ago, that eastern portion of China is where just about everybody lives, and that is where almost all the Han people live. That is what we call Inner China, or China proper. Because that's really where the Chinese live. They own all this stuff out west. They own all this stuff in Tibet and Xinjiang and Inner Mongolia. That's all part of the Chinese state. But the Chinese people have traditionally always lived in that eastern third of modern day China. And so you need to be familiar with the fact that Inner China or Eastern China is what we call the core of China. That's where all the economic activity really is. That's where the government control is. Western China, or outer China, is the periphery of China, as we're going to see later on. That's where a lot of resources are extracted from the ground. It's also where a lot of poverty is in China. We'll be talking about some of the specifics of all these different divisions in the next video.